Hi, I'm Bay Gaddafi, and this is Bible Study Verse by Verse. We're studying through a book of the Bible a verse at a time. This series of lessons is on the Gospel of John in the New Testament. If you'd find your Bible and open it to the Gospel of John, we'll begin in just a moment. John is the Bible book we're studying. This is lesson 37. We're starting with chapter 5 and verse 1. If you'd like to open your Bible there, we'll begin in a moment. We have a free offer of a written Bible study for you entitled, God is Omnipresent. You can request your copy by emailing me at the address shown at the end of the lesson. Let's begin by reading John chapter 5, starting in verse 1. After these things, there was a feast of the Jews. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was at Jerusalem by the sheep market a pool, which is called in the Hebrew tongue Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of impotent folk, of blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then first, after the troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole, of what, whatever disease he had. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you'd bless your word to us now, Lord. Help us as we um, study uh, what transpires here um, in this uh, interaction that Jesus has at the pool of Bethesda with this impotent man. Um, Lord, we're just moved by his case that he's been this way for so long and he's had no relief from it. And we just ask that you'd open our minds to it that uh, Lord, the Lord Jesus might be glorified, that we might see uh, him in action here as he uh, is moved by compassion and, uh, and understands this man's condition and, um, and heals him with just a word. We thank you for uh, your great mercy to us and healing us of our infirmities, of, of the sin that has infected our lives. Lord, uh, bring us close to yourself. Help us to worship you. Uh, Lord, uh, make us uh, your disciples, make us your learners, make us uh, disciple makers of others. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, so, um, chapter 4 ended with uh, the healing of the, um, the nobleman's son who lived in Capernaum. Jesus was in Cana uh, of Galilee, 16 miles away from Capernaum. The guy traveled there uh, because his son was at the point of death. Uh, uh, Jesus had, had words with him. It looked like he wasn't going to heal the guy's son, and the guy was persistent in his, uh, in his asking. Uh, he, he besought him that he would come down. His son was at the point of death. He basically wasn't going to take no for an answer. And Jesus uh, uh, heals him from that distance, and, um, and as the man travels home, he finds out that uh, when Jesus said, uh, you know, uh, go your way, your son, your son lives. It was at the same time that his son began to, 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 to be healed. So um, this happened in Galilee, which is north of um, Jerusalem, north of uh, Judea, north of Samaria. Uh, if you have a Bible map, you can look and see where it is, where Cana is on the Sea of Galilee. And now there's another feast and uh, verse 1 says, uh, a feast of the Jews, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was up because it was a city set on a hill. It was a high place. Uh, it was a place that you went up to. Uh, and um, at, uh, it's, it's at one of the three feasts probably that the Jews had where all the males were supposed to appear uh, before the Lord, or the Passover, Pentecost, or the Feast of Tabernacles. So Jesus obeyed this law and went up. Um, to Jerusalem uh, with all the other Jewish males. And um, uh, on the outskirts of the temple area, there was a wall around it, and there were gates into the area of the temple. And the northern, um, the northern part of, of that wall, there was a gate um, called the Sheep Gate. And that's, um, there, there probably was a market there. That's why the King James Bible interjects the word Sheep Market. Um, 
uh, the word market is added to make it make sense. Um, uh, they had a place where they sold sheep because you needed a sheep for an offering. You would buy it there. You would take it in by the sheep gate <laughs> into the temple area. And um, it's by this particular gate, a little bit uh, uh, north of there, a little bit away from it, there was a pool. And this pool had a uh, pool called Bethesda. It have, had five uh, porches or, or um, some of the more modern translations says covered porches, covered um, areas. So it was a pool and it had these five fingers that went out into it. And, uh, and each was covered and people would uh, be sitting on each one of these, sitting or lying or, or, uh, or placed on each one of these uh, protrusions into this pool. And uh, they were there uh, for the purpose of being healed because um, um, an angel, it says, would go down at a certain time. Uh, the, 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 the people that were there, um, the great multitude of them, I mean, it wasn't like, um, uh, you know, it was just somebody, somebody showed up by himself and was sitting there waiting for the, the water to be troubled. It was full of people because they all wanted to be healed. And this uh, particular pool, when the angel came down there, there was healing that transpired because he was there. They're waiting for the moving of the water. The angel would go down. He would trouble the water. In other words, the water would, would move in some way that and people would see this and then whoever would go first into the pool um, would be made whole of whatever disease that they had, whatever sickness that they had. Um, I mean, this is, um, we don't often think about this. We, we rightly put the Lord Jesus in uh, the, the first place in our worship, you know, uh, it's by faith in him that we're saved. He is our, he's our mediator between God and man. He is the, the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He's our high priest to offer up uh, his own blood um, in the tabernacle in heaven for us. I mean, there's so many ways that uh, we worship him. And um, we don't often think about the, the, the mediatorial role of angels um, that God uses them uh, in our lives um, to uh, f for our benefit. Um, for instance, um, take a look at Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4 and verse 11. Uh, this is after the temptation of the Lord Jesus in the wilderness by the devil. Forty days he didn't eat. And it, said the devil, it says the devil left him and behold angels came and ministered to him. So even uh, even to the, to, the, to the physical needs, the physical body of the Lord Jesus, angels uh, were ministers uh, to that need. They interceded for him and came to him out there in the wilderness to strengthen him. Um, look at Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. It, it's comparing Jesus to angels and saying there's no comparison. Jesus is so much far and above um, angelic beings that uh, there isn't really a comparison between the two. However, angels, um, it talks of them in verse 14, it says, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth? In other words, God sends forth angels as servants, ministering spirits to minister for those who shall be heirs of salvation. So for us who are saved, uh, we're called the saints in the scripture. Uh, believers, God sends forth His angels to minister, um, minister to us and minister His uh, His blessings to us. So, it, it, they did it for Jesus. They do it for the saints. Um, look at uh, Psalm thirty-four. Psalm thirty-four and verse seven. This one was particularly uh, meaningful to me when I was um, when I was flying a, an airplane in a war. It says the angel of the Lord encamps around those that fear him and he delivers them. You know, I mean, there were things that happened that shouldn't have happened that, you know, I, I should have been should have been dead. <laughs> and I believe that there was an angel that was around my airplane that um, encamped around it and, and delivered me from death. So um, angels, uh, angels were 
um, at the giving of the law. It says it was given at the the law was given at the hand of angels. Um, angels were there when Sodom and Gomorrah were was destroyed, and they brought Lot and his wife and his daughters out of that city, and uh, 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 they blinded the men that wanted to get in uh, to his house, so they couldn't come in and and um, and and um, wreak the havoc that they wanted to do with the with, with the men that had come to to rest under under Lot's protection. Uh, angels, um, just an angel destroyed all the firstborn uh, children and firstborn animals in Egypt uh, at the time of the Passover when uh, when the blood was sprinkled on the house. Uh, the blood without houses had the angel come in and destroy everything that was in there. And we're told in the New Testament that angels come and carry us, uh, carry us to heaven when we die. So, uh, there's a ministration that angels, angels do. They are ministering spirits. Um, um, here in this section, uh, back in John uh, chapter 5, uh, the, the angel, uh, an angel's coming down, stirring up this water. I mean, it's a fantastic story. Um, in, in verse 7, um, the man, I mean, these people are, are waiting there uh, not because of some rumor that they've heard or uh, some possibility that might just happen and, and, and they've all showed up. It's a multitude of people and they're all there and they're all looking for healing and it's happened before and they want it to happen to them and that's why they're there. And uh, the man's answer is he doesn't have anybody to put him into the water. I mean, he, he believes it too and they probably believe it because it's happened. Uh, and they, and they are aware that it's happened, and that's why they're 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 there. Um, you know, some of the uh, uh, some of the Greek uh, text uh, text uh, leave the leave these uh, leave the end of verse three and and verse four out of the text, saying it's not you know it's not genuine. But um, all, the majority of the manuscripts have this in there that this angel. Um, came and stirred the water, troubled the water, and whoever could get there first uh, was made was made well from whatever disease that they had. Um, verse 5 says, a certain man was there, he had this infirmity for 38 years. I mean, can you imagine um, being in a condition uh, that was uh, so pitiful as this, that for 38 years um, you're, you're not able to move? I mean, he's, he's a really slow mover. When that water is troubled and he's there and he wants to get in and he can't because other people can step down before him and um, uh, he doesn't have anybody to help him. They, they must have had to, to bring him there. Uh, uh, if he can't move down into the water when the, when the water is troubled um, on his own, He's going to have to have help to get there, help to get home. Every day they bring him there, every day they take him home. I mean, uh, what, a, what a pitiful um, life this man has. And Jesus is moved with a compassion um, about him. Jesus saw him lie and knew that, <clears throat> verse 6, knew that he had now been in that case a long time. Uh, he asked him this question. Will you be made whole? I mean, this is this is the question that <clears throat> we we ask to people who have not let not yet believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, God can heal you physically, and He, he may or may not. But uh, the most important thing you can do is trust in Him uh, for your salvation. That your sins can be forgiven. That um, you will have a relationship with Him that begins at that point where you. Uh, turn from your sin and trust in Him. Jesus asked him in verse uh, 6, uh, when He has compassion on him, when He understands His condition, that it's been a long time, it's been 38 years, will you be made whole? Of course, I mean, the answer is yes, I will be made whole. But He answers, the impotent man answers in verse 7, uh, Sir, I have no man when the water is troubled to put me into the pool, but while I'm coming, another steps down before me. So his um, his hope for healing is when the angel troubles the water to be put into the pool uh, to, to, to get there first so that he can be healed. And uh, he's such a slow mover that he can't even get there 
uh, when that happens, other people will step down into the pool before him so that he doesn't get healed, that they get healed. And um, Jesus, in verse 8, um, said to him, Arise, take up your bed, and walk. So uh, Jesus heals him immediately with this word. He tells him to get up, to pick up his bed, and to walk. And um, uh, no waiting around for an angel to come to the pool and, and, and not being able to get in before other people get in before him and get healed. Um, verse 9 says, Immediately the man was made whole. He took up his bed and walked, and the same day was the Sabbath day. Um, look at uh, Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, verses 2 through 7. It says, And behold, they brought to him a, a man sick of palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their face, said to the sick of palsy, this is probably the same instance in which uh, they let the guy down through the roof. Um, Matthew doesn't give all the details of it, but uh, the people that are bringing him have to take the tiles off the roof, take the roof apart to let him down because of the press of the people in the house. And um, Jesus uh, sees their faith and says to the person that they've let down, the person that's, that's paralyzed, that's sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, your, your sins are forgiven you. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Why do you think that evil in your hearts? For whether it's easier to say, Your sins are forgiven, or arise up and walk? That's a question but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Then he said to the sick of the palsy, Arise, take up your bed, and go into your house. And he arose and departed into his house. And when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God, which had given um, this power unto men. So uh, it was miraculous, and uh, Jesus, um, Jesus' uh, power to forgive sins was on display here and uh, to unbelievers uh, to understand that he had the power to forgive sins. Uh, the miracles authenticated that. They authenticated that he was from God. They authenticated that his word uh, was, um, uh, was from God and that he could forgive sins. And um, it's just a fantastic miracle. And, and, and back in John chapter uh, 5, um, this, this approaches unto that. Rise, take up your bed, and walk. The person that couldn't get up before, couldn't even get into the pool, is immediately made whole and, um, and, and obeys Jesus, picks up his bed, and, and, and walks away. Um, now, this is really going to get Jesus in trouble, um, what happens here, because he's doing this uh, on the Sabbath day. You'd think... Um, uh, verse 10, the Jews uh, therefore said to him that was cured, it is the Sabbath day. It's not lawful for you to carry your bed. So you'd think that they would say, wow, this guy's been healed. He was, he was, he's been so long in that infirmity. He can't even carry himself around. He can't even move. He's, you know, we know him. We've seen him in the city. He's such a pitiful thing. And now he's been healed and we're rejoicing. It's, it's miraculous. It's, um, it's extraordinary that, that this man who was in this condition is now healed. Instead of that reaction, uh, which is a, a reaction of joy and praising God and, and, and giving God the glory, they have the reaction, this is happening on the Sabbath day. You, you're carrying a bed. On the Sabbath day, you're working. On the Sabbath day, you're breaking the Sabbath law, and uh, and we can't have this. This is this is contrary to our law. Now that really wasn't the law; it was their man-made addition to God's law to say that they they defined you know how far you could walk and what you could do, and you can do this and you can do that. But you know, definitely carrying a bed on the Sabbath day would be a no-no. I don't, you know, I mean. It wasn't God's intention that uh, it should be like this. Um, there's a principle in the scripture that says um, the grace of God comes first in a person's life and then obedience comes next. 
So um, we as human beings like to flip that around and think, if I could just earn my salvation, if I could just be good enough, if I could just do the right things, then God would have to be gracious to me. But the opposite is true. Because God is gracious to us, he enables us then to be obedient to his law. So look back at Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, uh, we find this principle here. Um, it says, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God, which have brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. So this is right before God gives them the Ten Commandments, and he refers to the way that God has blessed them and, and, and delivering them out of slavery, out of their bondage, uh, out of Egypt, where they had uh, spent years uh, making bricks for the king, for the pharaoh, and were sore pressed by him. They cried unto God for deliverance. Moses raised, uh, God raised up Moses to be the deliverer. Moses spent 40 years away from, from, uh, from Egypt. Uh, tending sheep and then appeared to him in a burning God appeared to him in a burning bush and called him back to Egypt and and uh, through the ten plagues that God sent upon that land the tenth being the Passover were all the firstborn children in Egypt and all the firstborn animals were killed by an angel that went through the land uh, that was the deliverance that was the final straw for the Pharaoh the king he sent him out he changed his mind, of course, just like he did after every other one of the, of the plagues. But um, and he ended up in his army getting drowned in drowned in the sea that the Jews passed through on dry land. So that's what this is referring to. I'm the Lord your God. I brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And then, uh, then he begins to list the commandments. The verse four of them have to do with the worship of God, not putting any other God before the true God, not having any idols, not, not uh, and speaking well of God, not taking God's name in vain. And the fourth one is the one that um, the Jews have, uh, have accused this man of breaking, who picked up his bed just like Jesus told him to, and walked with his bed on the Sabbath day. And, and by extension, they're looking for they're looking for the man who did who told him to do this. Who told you to do that? I mean, why are you doing this? You're breaking the law. And um, he said, "Well, the guy that healed me told me to pick up my bed and to, and and to walk." And um, so they're looking uh, by extension. They're looking for Jesus to to call him a lawbreaker uh, to say that he is. Uh, that he that he has transgressed the law, and and it, it comes from here in um, uh, verse eight of Exodus chapter twenty. It says, "Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy." So <clears throat> it it sets out what the the, the Sabbath uh, commandment is. Um, it says, six days you shall labor and do all your work." So. Um, uh, you can work for six days. The seventh day belongs to God. The seventh day is the Sabbath to God. Uh, the seventh, verse 10 says, is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. It belongs to God. In it you shall not do any work. What kind of work? Well, the work that you normally do uh, the other six days, your normal occupation, the normal thing that you do to make a living, that one, on that day, you're not supposed to do that. It's pretty plain. Uh, and he lists all the all the uh, all the ways that it flows down into the society of a family. You're not supposed to do it. Your son, your daughter, your maidservant, uh, your manservant, your cattle, your, the stranger that was in your gates. Everybody's supposed to have a day, that day of rest set apart unto God. It's the Sabbath of the Lord. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. This is a creation ordinance. This dates back it's not just, oh, we, we got this when, uh, when the nation of Israel came out of Egypt and they received the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai and, um, and it started there. No, no, it started at creation. God made the world in six days and he rested on the seventh. God's not tired. It wasn't because, you know, oh boy, I'm pooped. It's been so, so, so difficult for me to do this. I mean, it was a breeze for him. It wasn't anything. He spoke and it stood firm. Uh, he's a creator that 
you know, he doesn't start with scratch like we do, you know. We go and get, um, we go and get the materials that we need to build something. He doesn't need materials to build anything. All he needs to do is speak. And uh, in six days, verse 11 says, he made the heaven and the earth and the sea that all that in them is, he rested on the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. It's a, it's a holy day. It's a day that's set apart to him. It's a day in which we are supposed to rest from our work and we are supposed to worship God. So um, out of our relationship with God, remember, you don't do these things to get a relationship. You do them because God has saved you, because you have a relationship with him, because he's extended grace to you and worked in your life. And you want to be obedient to him uh, because of what he's done for you. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. Not keep my commandments and maybe I'll have something to do with you. It's because God has moved in your heart. Why does a person come to God? It's because God draws him. Uh, wh why do these, uh, these people who, uh, who are pointing the finger at this man carrying his bed on the Sabbath day, what's wrong with them? They don't have the grace of God in their hearts. They're not saved people. They are, they are nitpickers. They are looking at the law that they've added to and, 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 um, and, and made, uh, made, they made the law a burden uh, upon people instead of a joy. And it was because they'd flip the principle around. We, you know, we can do these things. God's going to love us if we do these things. That's not the point. Point is that God has already loved them, and they are then to be obedient to these things out of a correct attitude, out of a correct heart. And six days the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea, all that his enemy rested the seventh day. He how he he blessed the Sabbath day and how hallowed it. So um, turn back to Genesis chapter two, um, first book in the Bible, second chapter in uh, verses one through three. And the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So <clears throat> there's the creation order. There's, uh, that's how come our week has seven days and we repeat it. Seven days and you start over. <clears throat> it's because of creation. God put it this way in the very beginning. He worked for six and he rested one. What are we supposed to do? Be obedient because of our love for him. We work for six and rest for one. I mean... Uh, the church today uh, has this day set aside for worship. We all meet on that day. All across the world, people who are Christians have this day set aside. We are looking to God uh, to rest from our work and to rejoice in what he's done for us in Christ. So um, uh, besides that, turn back to John chapter uh, 4 or John chapter 5. Besides that, you know, we know that Jesus was sinless. And uh, they're trying to get at him through this man that he's healed. Um, he was sinless. He doesn't tell anybody to do something that's a sin. He healed this guy and told him to pick up his bed. I mean, we can extrapolate from that, that picking up your bed on the Sabbath day is not the work that's referred to in that commandment. Um, um, you know, on the Sabbath day, you can rest you can worship God and you can do the works of God. And this was definitely a work of God. Um, they had a law in their, in their Old Testament that uh, if an animal um, that you had fell into a ditch on the, on the Sabbath day, that you, um, that you drew it out of the ditch. You didn't just leave the animal there to die in the ditch. It just doesn't make sense. I mean, there was, there was a hierarchy of the laws. Uh, you cared... Um, you cared for that animal and saved its life, even though you were working to bring it out of the ditch. Well, here Jesus has compassion on this man and heals him. I mean, the guy has fallen in the ditch. He's been there for 38 years, and uh, he's going to stay there because he can't get down into the water quick enough to get healed from his infirmity. And Jesus has compassion, and Jesus heals him. He's doing the work of God uh, on that day. 
um, the priest in the temple, when they served God and offered the sacrifices and did all the things that they did um, to uh, in the worship of God on the Sabbath day, they were blameless. They were working. That was their normal job. And they worked, but it was the work of God that they were doing. Preachers today, when they stand, I mean, if, if, if you have a good preacher, you know, you're blessed and you know that he prepares a message throughout the week as he studies and, and, um, and, and prepares to speak. And then on the Sabbath day, he delivers that message um, and, and he is working, but he's blameless because he's working the works of God. Um, you know, I mean, your conscience has to guide you into this as uh, some things are, are, are just apparent. You know, you need to be in you need to be in church. You need to worship God. You need to rest from your work. Uh, you can do the works of God. You know, I teach the Bible every Sunday. You know, I, I, it's a work for me to do that. I've got to prepare for it. But you know, it is the work that God uh, allows on that day uh, for the worship of God. So, um, what has happened here is this. Uh, we're going to end here in at the end of, of verse 10, and we'll pick up the, the, the rest of this chapter is uh, the conflict that he has with these leaders about uh, who he is and, and, and about his authority over, um, over illness, over sickness, his, his, uh, the, his reasons for doing what he did, and, and they, are, um, they are taking their... Um, their interpretation and their scrupulous additions to God's law and they're applying it to Jesus and he's saying this doesn't apply you guys are wrong and they're saying no we're right and and the conflict then is, ensues after that and um, and this sets the tone basically for the rest of the of of his interactions with the religious leaders in Jerusalem you know they are out to get him because of of who he says he is and because of what he can do and because they're looking for any little thing that they can find that he that he's done that's wrong so they can discredit him he is showing them up as being frauds and 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 being not of god and because he is of god and he is god and um and and there's a conflict that ensues about it and um the main area in which this conflict um, takes place is this uh, is the observance of the Sabbath day and and how these people say it should be observed and how Jesus says it should be observed well I hope that's been beneficial to you uh, let's pray father thank you for your word thank you for uh, Jesus healing this impotent man for 38 years he was uh, uh, in such a sad sad state um, and uh, uh, waiting by the water uh, to be um, to go into it to be healed and uh, Lord thank you that uh, there was a multitude of people there but Jesus singled this guy out uh, and had compassion on him and healed him uh, no water was needed no angel was needed and he took up his bed and he walked um, and he was rejoicing and he didn't even know Jesus's name at this point Lord thank you for um, what how you heal us from our infirmities, how you can take our sin away, how you can make us whole again, how you can give us a new heart and a new mind and you can bring us to yourself so that we can know you and love you and serve you. Lord, help us uh, to understand that your grace extended to us then uh, flows over into our love for you and our love for your law and our delight to be pleasing to you. Um, help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching. In the next lesson, Lesson 38, we'll begin with uh, chapter 5 and verse 11. I hope the Lord blesses you as you study His Word. Here's the description of the free title we're offering with this lesson. <clears throat> it's title number 2, and it's called God is Omnipresent. Where is God? What is His address? Is there some place where God isn't present? How far is He from you? Where can you go to hide from God? These questions are all uh, addressed in this lesson. If you'd like, it's a written lesson. If you'd like a copy of it, you can um, write me. Or if you have questions or comments about this lesson, uh, please write me at a Bible study, v by v at gmail.com. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more Bible study, verse by verse.